Ray, Russell, Xavier, Connie, and I were driving down a dark and desolate road on a rainy night. The raindrops were pounding against the roof of the car, creating an eerie symphony of sounds that seemed to echo throughout the vehicle. The headlights illuminated the road ahead, but the darkness beyond the beams seemed to go on forever. As we drove deeper into the night, I felt a creeping sense of unease begin to settle in. The rain was making it difficult to see the road clearly, and the wind was howling through the trees, creating an unsettling atmosphere. Suddenly, the car sputtered and came to a stop. We all looked at each other in disbelief, wondering what had happened. Russell tried to turn the engine over, but it wouldn't start. Looks like we're stuck here, Xavier said, an unusual note of worry in his voice. We all got out of the car, huddling together in the rain as we tried to figure out what to do next. As we stood there, we heard a strange sound in the distance, a low, guttural growl that seemed to come from the darkness beyond the road. We all froze, looking at each other with growing unease. Ray spoke up first. What the hell was that? They asked. I don't know, I replied, my heart racing in my chest. But we need to get back in the car and lock the doors. We hurried back to the car and scrambled inside, locking the doors and rolling up the windows. But the growling continued, growing louder and more menacing with each passing moment. Suddenly, there was a loud thud on the roof of the car, and we all jumped in fear. I looked up, and through the rain, I could see a dark shape moving across the roof. What the hell is that? Russell shouted, his voice shaking with fear. Before anyone could answer, the shape on the roof lunged at the windshield, cracking it with a sickening sound. We all screamed and huddled together in the back seat as the creature continued to attack the car. We were trapped, with no way to escape the horror that was unfolding around us. As the rain continued to fall and the creature continued to attack, I knew that this night would be one that would haunt me forever. Before we started driving down that dark and desolate road on that rainy night, Ray had suggested that we take a shortcut through the woods. They had heard about it from a friend and claimed it would cut our driving time in half. I was skeptical at first, but Russell and Xavier were all for it, so I reluctantly agreed. We turned off the main road and onto a narrow dirt path that wound through the trees. The rain was already starting to fall, but we pressed on, thinking we could make it through before it got too bad. That's when we started to hear the strange noises, rustling in the bushes, footsteps crunching on the wet ground. We tried to ignore it, chalking it up to our imaginations, but the noises grew louder and more persistent. Then suddenly, we saw it, a figure looming in the darkness ahead of us. It was too dark to make out any features, but it was definitely humanoid and seemed to be watching us. We all froze, not knowing what to do. That's when the figure started moving towards us, slowly at first, then picking up speed. We turned and ran back towards the car, but it was too late. The figure had caught up to us and attacked. We fought back as best we could, but it was like fighting against a force of nature. The figure was too strong, too fast, and seemed to be immune to our blows. It wasn't until Ray managed to grab a large branch and strike the figure across the head that it finally retreated into the darkness. We all breathed a sigh of relief and piled back into the car, shaken but alive. We should have turned back then, but for some reason we decided to press on. And that's how we found ourselves stranded on that dark and desolate road, with the creature still out there somewhere, waiting for us. As we drove down that dark and desolate road, we were all on edge after the encounter with the mysterious figure in the woods. But things only got worse from there. Russell, who had been quiet since the attack, suddenly turned on us. His eyes glowed with an otherworldly light, and he began muttering strange incantations under his breath. We didn't know what was happening, but we knew it wasn't good. Then, he pulled out a gun and pointed it at us. Fear coursed through my veins as I realized that we were all in danger. But just as Russell was about to pull the trigger, Connie, my partner, jumped into action. With a strength I had never seen before, they tackled Russell to the ground and disarmed him. But the figure wasn't done yet. It began to possess Russell even more fully, its otherworldly abilities taking hold of his mind and body. Connie and I fought back as best we could, but it was like trying to stop a force of nature. Russell, or whatever was controlling him, seemed to be too powerful for us. Just when it seemed like all hope was lost, the figure suddenly released its hold on Russell and retreated into the darkness. We were all shaken, 
but thankfully, we were alive, and it was all thanks to Connie's quick thinking and bravery. As we continued down the road, I couldn't help but think about how lucky I was to have them by my side. As we continued down the dark and desolate road, a new feeling of unease settled in the pit of my stomach. Despite the danger we had just narrowly escaped, there was a sense that something even worse was coming. I glanced up at the rearview mirror and my heart nearly stopped at what I saw. Connie's eyes, which had always been a warm hazel, were now glowing with an otherworldly light, just like the figure's eyes had before. Babe, what's happening to you? I whispered, my voice barely above a whisper. But Connie didn't answer. Instead, their body began to shake and convulse as if they were fighting against some unseen force. The car swerved on the road, and I struggled to keep it under control as I tried to help Connie. But just as it seemed like all was lost, Xavier, who had been sitting in the back seat, jumped into action. With a strength that belied his small stature, he lunged forward and grabbed Connie by the shoulders, pulling him away from the driver's seat. Get out of the car! Xavier shouted as she opened the door and shoved Connie out onto the road. We need to get away from them! We scrambled out of the car and ran as fast as we could down the road, the rain pouring down on us in sheets. Behind us, we could hear Connie screaming, their voice distorted by whatever was possessing them. Eventually, we came across an abandoned gas station, and we huddled inside, trying to catch our breath and figure out what to do next. I was grateful to Xavier for saving me from the possessed Connie, but I couldn't shake the feeling that something even more sinister was lurking just out of sight, waiting for its next victim. Despite the fear and uncertainty that plagued me, I couldn't leave Connie to face the unknown alone. Without a second thought, I turned around and ran back towards the possessed figure and my partner. Xavier and Ray called out for me to come back, but their voices were drowned out by the pounding of my heart and the sound of the rain. I knew they were right to be afraid, but I couldn't leave my partner behind, not when I loved them so deeply. As I approached Connie, I could see that their body was racked with spasms, and their eyes were still glowing with an otherworldly light. When I reached out to touch them, something strange happened. The figure possessing them seemed to falter, as if confused by my presence. For a moment I thought that I might be able to help them, to free them from whatever was controlling them, but before I could do anything, a deep, guttural growl filled the air, and the figure turned to face me. Its eyes burned with an intense, malevolent light, and I could feel a wave of cold dread wash over me. I tried to back away, but it was too late. The figure lunged forward, its claws extended, and I felt a searing pain as they dug into my flesh. For a moment, everything went black, and I was certain that I was going to die. But then, I heard a voice calling out my name, and suddenly, the figure was gone. When I opened my eyes, I saw Connie kneeling beside me, their face twisted with worry. Behind them, Xavier and Ray stood, their expressions a mix of relief and concern. Are you okay? Connie asked, their voice shaking. What happened? I struggled to sit up, wincing as I touched the wound on my arm. It was deep and ugly, but already starting to heal. I don't know, I said, my voice unable to be above a whisper. But we need to get out of here, now. Connie helped me to my feet and we embraced tightly. I love you, we said to each other. As we continued down the road, the rain began to lessen, and the clouds above us cleared. The moonlight shone down on us, casting eerie shadows across the landscape. Suddenly we came across the source of all our troubles. It stood before us, a massive, imposing figure, with a deep, rumbling voice that seemed to shake the very earth beneath our feet. I knew then that I had to confront it, to put an end to its reign of terror. So, without a second thought, I stepped forward, my heart pounding with a mix of fear and determination. But just as I was about to speak, the figure vanished, leaving nothing but the sound of its laughter echoing through the night. I turned back to my friends, my face a mask of confusion and frustration. What the hell was that? I asked, my voice trembling. But there was no answer. Only silence, broken only by the sound of the rain and the distant howl of the wind. My friends had disappeared. In that moment, I knew that my troubles were far from over. The figure had eluded me once again, and I could only wonder what other horrors lay in store for us in the darkness ahead. With a deep breath, I stepped forward, my eyes fixed on the spot where the figure had been only moments before. 
I was determined to put an end to this once and for all. In the back of my mind, my friends called out to me, pleading with me to reconsider, to wait for backup, but I knew that there was no time to waste. The longer I waited, the more innocent lives could be lost. As I approached the spot where the figure had been, I could feel a chill run down my spine. I knew that this was it, the moment of truth. With a sudden burst of courage, I shouted out into the darkness, daring the figure to show itself, to face me in combat. But there was no answer, only the sound of my own heartbeat, pounding in my chest like a war drum. And then, out of the shadows, it emerged. A massive, twisted creature with glowing eyes that seemed to stare right through me. Without hesitation, I launched myself forward, my fists flying as I struck at the creature with all my might. Then, darkness. I woke up in a hospital bed, my body battered and bruised, with no memory of how I got there. My friends were all there, looking at me with concern and relief. But there was something in their eyes, a hint of fear and uncertainty that I couldn't quite place. As the days passed, I struggled to piece together what had happened, but the memories remained elusive. All I knew was that something terrible had happened that night, something that I could never forget. And as I lay there, recovering from my injuries, I knew that the darkness was still out there, waiting for its chance to strike once again. And I could only hope that we would be ready when it did. As I sat at the party surrounded by my friends, I couldn't help but feel a sense of unease. It had been a year since that fateful night, and although we had all moved on with our lives, I could never shake the feeling that something was still not right. I was chatting with Russell, and then Ray came up to me and asked if we could chat privately. Nothing too out of the ordinary for them. As Ray and I spoke about everything we'd missed in each other's life since we last caught up, they asked me a question, which slightly took me aback. They asked if I would be interested in going back to the forest where that fateful night had happened. I responded with a mix of anger and confusion. Why the hell would you ever want to go back there? They replied, I want to be where I'm strongest. Confused, I asked, Strongest? What does that mean? Ray turned to me chuckling, and as our eyes met, I saw something that made my blood run cold. Their eyes were glowing, just like the otherworldly creature's eyes had so many years ago. Being a park ranger at Mount Rainier has always been my dream, one of those childhood fantasies that somehow became a reality. Yet here I am, grappling with an insidious nightmare that makes every breath a struggle. Ever since the start of 2022, a disturbing pattern of people vanishing without a trace began to emerge within the park. 25 people in total. All were healthy, all in their prime, all swallowed by the mountain. What unnerved me the most wasn't the frequency of these occurrences, but rather the nonchalance with which our park administration treated them. Each missing report was handled in the same cold, bureaucratic manner. We would reassure the distraught family members, promise them we'd leave no stone unturned. But as soon as they left, our superiors would subtly discourage us from investigating further. Instead, a third-party search and rescue company was contracted to handle the cases. I recall vividly the day the first directive came down. Focus on the trail conditions, they told us. Leave the search and rescue to the professionals. It stung, you know. This was our park. These were our people. Yet we were supposed to turn a blind eye and pretend as if nothing was amiss. A palpable tension began to stretch through our ranks, but none dared to openly question the orders. Each new disappearance added to the mounting dread that hung over us. Yet what could we do? Our hands were tied. An unspoken rule was established. We, the park rangers of Mount Rainier, did not interfere with the missing persons cases. At first I tried to rationalize it. A rough winter had left the trails in a bad state. Then there was the influx of novice hikers, with barely enough experience to set up a tent, let alone survive the treacherous park terrain. And of course, there was the pressure from higher-ups to keep the park's image clean. The last thing they needed was the media painting Mount Rainier as a place where people disappeared. I even found some comfort in this logic. It allowed me to sleep at night. Until, of course, it didn't. Even though I maintained my ranger duties on the surface, my mind never strayed far from the disturbing trend. I found myself studying the faces of the hikers I met along the trails. 
secretly hoping I wouldn't be the next one to report them missing. Working in the heart of such wild, uncontrolled beauty, it was easy to forget the danger that lurked behind the curtain of towering pines and serene rivers. But those faces, the ones that would only return to us in crinkled photographs or desperate, hopeful pleas from relatives, were a harsh reminder of our powerlessness in the face of the unforgiving wilderness. Or was it something even more sinister? The silence of the park, which used to be my solace, began to echo with hidden threats. I was on edge, jumping at the rustle of leaves, the snap of twigs, but little did I know the true horror was yet to come. And it all started with a simple hike up the Ipsut Pass Trail. But I'm getting ahead of myself. To understand, you must first know the fear, the doubt, the questions that haunted each of us rangers at Mount Rainier. There's a peculiar solitude that comes with being a park ranger. It's not loneliness, but a state of oneness with the natural world, a feeling that you're a small part of something immense and ancient. My hike up to the Ipsut Pass was filled with such moments, broken only by the crunch of my boots against the trail and the occasional songbird. Despite the tension that had become my constant companion, I found myself lost in the raw beauty of the park, momentarily forgetting the unsettling occurrences. As I trudged along the winding trail, the gentle whisper of the wind through the evergreens and the soft rustle of unseen creatures served as my only companions. It was just another day at work, or so it seemed. As I approached a bend in the trail, a glinting anomaly caught my eye. An odd light shone from the forest floor, about fifty feet from the trail. Initially I dismissed it as sunlight bouncing off a patch of water, or some wayward hiker's discarded trash. But as I drew closer, I realized the light was constant, unchanging, not an effect of the shifting sun. Curiosity peaked. I made my way through the dense undergrowth, my heart pounding with a mix of thrill and apprehension. Thoughts of the missing hikers buzzed like an annoying fly at the back of my mind, but I swatted them away. There had to be a logical explanation, there always was. As I approached the source, the oddity of it stopped me in my tracks. The light wasn't just on the forest floor, it was emanating from underneath it. Removing my pack, I knelt down for a closer look. Kneading the soil beneath my fingers, it became clear that the glow was coming from beneath a thin layer of dirt and fallen leaves. I felt an odd sensation, like a shiver racing down my spine, and glanced around instinctively. The forest was as it always was, still, quiet, indifferent. Ignoring the uneasy feeling creeping up on me, I dug around the light source with my fingers. As I moved the dirt away, I felt the hard edge of something buried, a corner of what seemed to be a well-disguised trap door. It was meticulously camouflaged, blending almost perfectly with the forest floor. The realization was chilling. Without that faint light peeking through, I'd have walked past it a hundred times, none the wiser. Trepidation surged through me, but the lure of solving the mystery was too strong. Maybe this was related to the missing hikers, or maybe it was just a hidden seismometer. Either way, I had to know. Carefully, I lifted the door. The sliver of daylight that broke into the space beneath revealed a burrow of sorts, small and cramped, with an electric camping torch at one corner. Its dull, flickering light was what I had seen from the trail. At that moment, an icy dread began to fill me. This was no ordinary burrow. It was a piece of the puzzle that had been missing, the unknown variable in the disturbing equation of Mount Rainier. But little did I know, it was only the beginning. The real terror was yet to reveal itself. With the small trapdoor ajar, a sense of foreboding washed over me. My heart pounded in my chest as I peered into the confined space, barely large enough for a person. Inside was nothing more than a camping torch, sputtering with fading light. I found it strange to find such an item in a makeshift burrow. My pulse quickened at the realization that this wasn't something accidental. It was intentional, and whoever was responsible was coming prepared. Before my courage could wane, I thrust my head into the burrow for a closer look. The earthy smell of the soil was overwhelming. As I adjusted to the confined space, I noticed Polaroid photos tacked on the inner walls of the burrow. My blood ran cold at the sight. They were candid shots of hikers, each taken from a low angle, as though the photographer was crouching or lying on the ground. The pit in my stomach grew with each photo I recognized, 
the smiling faces of those reported missing over the past year, frozen in time. I felt sick, the full implication of my discovery washing over me. I was staring at the collected trophies of an unseen predator. This was no ordinary burrow. It was a lair, a hideout. It was as though someone, or something, was stalking the hikers, keeping track of their movements, their habits, waiting for the perfect moment to strike. My mind spun with gruesome possibilities. What if this person, this entity, was responsible for all the disappearances? It was horrifying to consider. I had unknowingly stumbled upon a concealed den of terror in the heart of Mount Rainier. My once cherished solitude suddenly felt like vulnerability. I was alone, far from help, with a potential predator lurking nearby. As I pored over the photos, my heart pounded in my ears. My own face stared back at me from one of the Polaroids. It was a recent photo, taken perhaps half an hour ago while I was walking the very same trail. The icy grip of fear clenched my heart. I wasn't just an intruder stumbling upon a lair. I was the next potential victim. The sound of a twig snapping behind me yanked me from my horrified trance. Adrenaline surged through my veins, and without a second thought, I scrambled out of the burrow, leaving the trap door gaping behind me. I ran back along the trail, not daring to look back, each rustle of leaves, each snap of a twig magnifying my terror. I didn't stop until I reached the safety of the wilderness cabin near Ipsut campground. Exhausted and shaken, I barricaded myself inside, waiting for the dawn to come, waiting for another ranger to find me. The peace and tranquility of Mount Rainier had been shattered, replaced by a menacing dread. But even in my worst nightmares, I could not have imagined what was to come. I was far from the end of my ordeal. The real terror was yet to unfold. Sleep evaded me that night, each creak of the cabin and rustle of wind outside echoing my rising panic. My discovery had turned the peace of the park into an echoing, empty void of terror. As the first rays of dawn pierced through the cabin's window, I breathed a sigh of relief. The arrival of another ranger later that morning did nothing to ease my mind, but at least I wasn't alone. I persuaded him to accompany me back to the trail, though I remained cryptic about my reasons. He seemed annoyed, but agreed nonetheless. My hope was to find the burrow again, to share my horrifying discovery. However, after an hour of searching, the camouflage door was nowhere to be found. It was as if the earth had swallowed it whole, leaving no trace of the horror beneath. Doubt started to creep into my mind. Had I imagined it all? Was the stress of the job playing tricks on me? But the Polaroids, the faces, my face, all were too vivid to be mere hallucinations. Upon returning to the ranger station, I found myself confronted by my manager. His furrowed brow and sharp gaze made it clear that he was suspicious about my odd behavior and sudden need for time off. I mumbled some excuse about a family emergency, not daring to share the truth. I felt a strong instinct that sharing my findings would lead to more harm than good, perhaps even cost me my job. The eerie tranquility of my home was a stark contrast to the storm raging within me. I couldn't shake off the dread of the day's discovery, nor the nagging feeling of being watched. The forest, which once held beauty and peace, now only offered fear and anxiety. My troubling thoughts were interrupted by a glinting object inside the kitchen air vent. It was too big to be dust, too shiny to be debris. Kneeling down for a closer inspection, I realized it was a small object lodged within the vent. With a sinking feeling, I removed the grating and reached in. My blood turned to ice when I pulled out a Polaroid photo. It was a picture of me, taken earlier that day, making breakfast in my own kitchen. The same eerie low angle, the same candid capture, it was identical to the photos I'd found in the burrow. My heart pounded against my ribs as the full realization hit me. I wasn't alone. This silent predator wasn't confined to the wilderness of Mount Rainier. It had followed me, invaded my home, my sanctuary. The terror I felt on the trail resurfaced, multiplied a hundred times over. The unseen stalker was closer than I had ever imagined, observing, waiting, and I had no idea who or what it was. But one thing was certain, this was not the end. The danger was real, and it was far closer than I ever could have thought. The game of cat and mouse had escalated. The question was, could I uncover the truth before it was too late? As I held the Polaroid, my hands shaking uncontrollably, I realized the depth of my predicament. 
I was not just a witness to these horrifying events, but also the target of this insidious predator. The sanctuary I had created within my home had been violated. Whoever, or whatever, was stalking the hikers in Mount Rainier had trailed me home, turning my safe haven into another hunting ground. Days turned into nights in a blur. The isolation, once a source of tranquility, now became a prison. Each shadow held a threat, every noise a harbinger of danger. I was living on the edge, a prey waiting for the predator to strike. I began to investigate, my instincts as a park ranger coming to the forefront. I installed security cameras, kept an eye out for anything unusual, anything that could give me a clue about the identity of the stalker. But the stalker remained elusive, a ghost that lurked in the shadows. The tension was unbearable. Sleep was a distant memory. Every creak of the house, every rustling of leaves outside amplified my fear. My once peaceful home now echoed with unseen horrors, as did the vast expanse of Mount Rainier, which loomed ominously in the distance. The climax of my terror arrived one chilling night. I woke up to a sound coming from the living room. Adrenaline pumping, I crept down the stairs. The room was lit only by the faint moonlight streaming through the window. I held my breath as I peered around the corner. There, on my coffee table, was a pile of freshly printed Polaroids. I felt my blood run cold as I approached the table. The top photo was of me, taken from outside the window while I was asleep just a few moments ago. The same eerie, low angle, the same silent capture of the unassuming victim. I leafed through the photos, each one a candid shot of me going about my daily life, utterly unaware of the silent watcher. My eyes widened in horror as I reached the final photo. It was not a picture of me but of my bedroom window, seen from outside the house. And there, in the reflection of the window glass, was the faint outline of a figure, too indistinct to make out any features but humanoid, crouched low to the ground, camera in hand. I felt a chill run down my spine as I dropped the photos, backing away. It was too late to deny the reality of my situation. I was not just living in fear, I was living with fear, a terrifying entity whose intentions remained unknown. The silent stalker of Mount Rainier had made it clear. The game had just begun. My ordeal was far from over. As the once comforting silence of my home was filled with ominous echoes of unseen danger, I was left with a terrifying certainty. I was not alone and I was being hunted. But by whom or what I was still to find out. The terror of Mount Rainier had followed me home, turning my sanctuary into a terrifying trap. The first rays of morning light were just beginning to creep over the vast horizon, splintering through the towering trees of Yosemite National Park. My hands tightened around the steering wheel of the patrol truck, dirt and gravel crunching beneath its tires as I maneuvered through the dense forest path. The branches scraped against the windows like skeletal hands begging for attention. I'd always found a certain calm in these quiet, solitary drives through the park. It was a place filled with beauty, solitude, but also danger. A danger I was trained to mitigate. As a park ranger, I was the gatekeeper of this vast expanse of wilderness, tasked with protecting its visitors and nature alike. I had to keep an eye out for mischievous wildlife and fallen trees, as well as unruly hunters and clueless campers. But today was different. Today there was something else out there, something I couldn't quite place. A flicker of movement to my left drew me from my reverie. A lone figure stood in a rock-strewn field, silhouetted against the rising sun. A woman. My eyebrows furrowed in confusion. She was in the middle of nowhere, and the way she was standing there, all alone, seemed off. She had no hiking equipment, no backpack, nothing. I slowed the truck and leaned out of the window. The woman, having heard the truck, turned to look at me. Her face was expressionless, her eyes distant. Instead of acknowledging me, she began to march up the rocky slope. A chill of unease wound its way up my spine. In this wilderness, any sign of another human was usually met with relief, even joy. Yet she chose to walk away. Hey miss, are you okay? I called out to her. No answer. She continued her ascent until she reached the top and vanished into the tree line. An odd feeling twisted in my gut, a sense of recognition, her face dot dot dot. T was familiar. Where had I seen her before? 
Intrigued, I pulled up a file on my laptop. The database was filled with photographs of people reported missing in this area. After scrolling through dozens of entries, my heart pounded in my chest as I finally found her. The same woman, the same face. She'd been reported missing eight months ago. But that couldn't be right, could it? She looked nothing like someone who'd been living in these harsh woods for eight months. She was too clean, too... normal. But her clothes, they were different. The unease began to twist into fear. I grabbed the radio, my hand trembling slightly, and reported my encounter to the station. Leaving the truck behind, I packed my gear and took off on foot, following the direction the woman had gone. I needed to find her, to figure out how she had survived, and to ensure she got home safely. The journey ahead was uncertain, but one thing was sure. I had to find her. The lone woman in the wilderness was a mystery I was determined to unravel. The answers were out there, hidden amongst the trees, waiting to be discovered. The forest of Yosemite was an emerald maze, and in the heart of this labyrinth, I found myself. The sky above was veiled by a thick canopy, leaving the undergrowth shrouded in half-light, and the air was heavy with the scent of pine and damp earth. Armed with my gear, I ascended the rocky slope, my eyes scanning for any signs of the woman. I found her tracks leading into the trees, their imprint fresh in the damp soil. Despite the worry gnawing at me, I felt a glimmer of relief. I was on her trail. Like a hunter, I traced her steps, winding through the dense forest. It felt like a game of hide-and-seek, only the stakes were infinitely higher. The further I went, the more uneasy I became. She had moved too far, too fast for someone who appeared to be in a condition of exhaustion or distress. It was as if she was leading me somewhere, or away from something. But suddenly the tracks vanished, swallowed by the forest floor. A chill ran down my spine as I stood there, alone in the vast wilderness. How could she have disappeared like that? I couldn't shake the feeling that I was missing something vital, a clue that was staring me right in the face. Driven by determination, I pushed forward, hoping that the trail would reappear further ahead. The forest was unyielding, each step was a battle against thick undergrowth and creeping roots, but I pressed on. The silent watch of the trees seemed to grow more oppressive, their gnarled shapes ominous in the dim light. Then I saw it, a staircase, in the middle of the forest. It stood starkly against the wild backdrop, eerily out of place. What the hell is that? I muttered to myself. My heart pounded in my chest as I moved closer, my brain struggling to make sense of the sight. It was ordinary in every way, save for its location. The wood seemed relatively new, free from the usual ravages of time and weather. What is this doing out here? I asked aloud, the echo of my voice a stark contrast to the silence of the forest. The staircase led to nowhere, ending abruptly after thirteen steps. The odd number sent a shudder down my spine. Was it a coincidence? Or was there some significance to it? A strange pull, an unexplainable curiosity drew me towards the staircase. Despite the growing sense of unease, I found myself approaching it. As I neared, I felt the forest close in around me. The feeling of being watched intensified, and a prickly sensation ran down my back. But I couldn't turn back. I was drawn to the stairs, as if they were a key to unraveling the mystery of the lone woman. What was their purpose? What was their connection to her? Questions buzzed in my mind like angry bees. As I ascended the stairs, the forest seemed to hold its breath. With every step, my paranoia grew stronger, a sense of being followed, of not being alone. Yet every time I turned around, nothing but trees met my eyes. The solitude, the silence, the stairs, everything felt uncannily wrong. I should have turned back. I should have left. But I didn't. I couldn't. I had a mission, a duty to find the woman and get her to safety. Even if it led me deeper into the heart of the unknown, I was determined to see it through. And so, I ascended the mysterious staircase, unaware of the terror that was to come. As I reached the top of the staircase, a profound dread washed over me. My hand tightened around my walking stick, each nerve tingling with heightened alertness. What I was doing felt counterintuitive to my survival instincts but I forced myself to press on. Looking down, my gaze met the towering trees, their branches rustling in the gentle breeze. There was no rooftop, no house, no structure to justify the presence of these stairs, just a sudden termination into the canopy, the staircase ending as abruptly as it began. 
Behind me, the silence was interrupted by a strange rustling. I quickly turned around, but found nothing. Just an array of undergrowth and trees, swaying eerily in the wind. Yet the feeling of being watched was more intense now, and I couldn't shake the sensation that something was wrong. Summoning my courage, I descended the stairs, my heart pounding in my chest. The air was cooler now, and I could feel the chill seeping into my bones. When I reached the bottom, I found the woman's footprints again, more profound and easier to follow. It was as if she had deliberately made her path clearer after passing the stairs. I followed her tracks through the dense woods, my senses on high alert. As I ventured further, I came across a small clearing where the moonlight filtered through the trees and illuminated the undergrowth. There, in the center, was a single folded piece of paper. It was the first real clue that I'd found since the tracks had disappeared. Cautiously, I picked it up and unfolded it. The note was written in a hurried scrawl, and it was clear the author had been under duress. The words were simple, yet chilling. They are watching. Don't trust the stairs. A cold shiver ran down my spine. They? Who were they? I found myself looking back towards the staircase, its ominous presence more unsettling now. I shoved the note in my pocket and pushed on, more desperate than ever to find the woman. I quickened my pace, her footprints leading me deeper into the dense forest. As I walked, the forest's sounds seemed amplified, every rustle of the leaves, every snap of a twig, and the eerily haunting hoot of an owl. I felt the pressure mounting, the darkness pressing in around me. The silence was no longer comforting. It was a menacing quiet that amplified my growing fear. Somewhere in the distance, a low growl echoed. I froze in my tracks. My heart pounded in my chest as I strained to listen. I heard it again, a little closer this time. Panic surged through me. There was something out there with me. I wasn't alone. Gripping my walking stick tighter, I ventured further, hoping against hope that I was close to finding her. But as the growling grew louder, so did my fear. What had started as a simple rescue mission was quickly morphing into a nightmarish scenario. I'd always viewed myself as the protector, the hero. But out here, in the heart of the forest, faced with unseen threats and chilling messages, I was starting to question everything. I was no longer the hunter but the hunted, teetering on the brink of a precipice I hadn't even known existed. The feeling of impending doom was unbearable, but I knew I had to press on. I had to find her. As I continued to follow the footprints deeper into the forest, my mind raced. It was hard to keep my imagination from running wild as I tried to piece together what could have happened to the woman. Every odd-shaped shadow or strange noise sent a fresh jolt of terror coursing through my veins. Eventually, the tracks led me to a cave hidden amongst the thick undergrowth. The mouth of the cave yawned open like a monstrous beast, the darkness within promising untold horrors. I hesitated, looking back towards the distant staircase and the relative safety it represented. But I knew I had to go in. Taking a deep breath, I stepped into the cave, my walking stick tapping against the stone floor. The echo seemed to bounce endlessly off the walls, an ominous reminder of the loneliness and isolation I felt. As I ventured further, I could see faint scratch marks on the stone walls. Desperate attempts of escape? I shuddered at the thought. Suddenly, an inhuman screech reverberated through the cave. I froze, my heart pounding against my ribcage like a trapped bird. It sounded close, too close. Then I saw it, the entity. It was unlike anything I had ever seen before, a formless mass of shadow and menace. It moved with an eerie grace, phasing in and out of the cave walls as if bound by different laws of physics. I watched as it coalesced into the vague shape of a humanoid, its form flickering and shifting in the dim light. As it noticed my presence, the entity let out another deafening screech, its form lurching towards me. I was paralyzed with fear, my mind unable to process the nightmare that was unfolding before me. It was the embodiment of every childhood fear, every nightmare, every story of things that go bump in the night. In a flash of instinct, I thrust my walking stick towards it. The stick passed right through the entity, sending ripples through its form. It let out another horrifying scream, its shape momentarily destabilizing before it resumed its advance. I turned to run but stumbled over a loose stone. As I hit the ground, my hand brushed against something cold and metallic. Looking down, I saw an old iron dagger with strange runes etched onto the blade. 
It was just like the one depicted on the map, the one that was supposed to defeat the entity. With a surge of hope, I grasped the dagger tightly and faced the entity. I could feel the chill from its form seeping into my bones, sapping my strength. But I refused to give in. I had come too far to let fear stop me now. With a guttural cry, I thrust the dagger towards the entity. There was a blinding flash of light followed by an ear-splitting shriek. When I could see again, the entity was gone. The cave was silent once more. I fell to my knees, my body trembling from the adrenaline. The entity was defeated, at least for now. But where was the woman? Was she still alive? A wave of despair washed over me as I picked myself up and ventured further into the cave. What I saw next made my blood run cold. Tied up in the far corner of the cave was the woman, unconscious, but alive. I rushed over, my relief mingling with a newfound determination. I had defeated the entity, and I was going to get her out of here. I was going to get us both out of here. I untied the woman, her body slumping against me, unconscious but breathing. I had never felt so relieved in my life, but the relief was short-lived as I realized the daunting task ahead of us. We had to get out of this cave, back through the forest and down the staircase, all without attracting the entity's attention again. Slinging her arm over my shoulder, I began our arduous journey. Every step was a struggle, her weight slowing me down, but I gritted my teeth and pressed on, the thought of her dying on my watch spurring me on. The deeper we went into the forest, the more my fears began to resurface. What if the entity wasn't really gone? What if it came back for us? Every rustle of the leaves, every snap of a twig, every gust of wind had me on high alert. It was in the dead of the night when we finally reached the base of the staircase. My body ached with exhaustion, and I was pretty sure I had a couple of cracked ribs from a fall I took earlier. But there was no time to rest. The sooner we got down the staircase, the safer we would be. As I began to ascend, I realized that the climb was harder than I had anticipated. The steps were narrow and uneven, threatening to trip us at every turn. But worse than the physical strain was the fear. The fear that with each step I took, the entity could be right behind us, ready to strike. A low growl echoed in the distance and I froze. I looked back, squinting through the darkness. There was nothing. I breathed a sigh of relief and turned back around, but as I did, my foot slipped. I cried out as I tumbled down the steps, the woman in my arms. When I came to a stop, my entire body screamed in pain, but there was no time to dwell on it. I pulled myself up, wincing as I checked on the woman. She was still unconscious but alive. I breathed a sigh of relief and hoisted her back onto my shoulder. Every step after that was a battle. My body begged for rest, for respite, but I had to keep going. I had to keep climbing. As the first rays of dawn broke through the canopy, I saw the end of the staircase. A jolt of hope shot through me. We were almost there. With the last bit of strength I had, I pushed forward. The staircase seemed to go on forever each step a painful reminder of the night's events. But finally, after what felt like an eternity, we reached the top. I collapsed on the ground, exhaustion taking over. The sun was fully up now, bathing the forest in a warm, golden light. It was a stark contrast to the cold, unforgiving darkness of the night. The woman stirred next to me. Her eyes fluttered open, confusion etched on her face. I offered her a weak smile and passed out. I had done it. We had escaped. We were free. I awoke in a bed, the sheets a crisp, sterile white. The scent of antiseptic filled my nostrils. The room was unfamiliar, lit by the soft glow of the morning sun filtering through the blinds. The hum of machines surrounded me. A hospital, I realized. My body ached as I pushed myself up to a sitting position, wincing at the sharp sting in my ribs. Looking down, I saw bandages wrapped tightly around my chest. The events of the past days hit me like a wave. The entity, the woman, the escape. It all seemed so surreal now. A knock on the door jolted me from my thoughts. A woman in a nurse's uniform walked in, surprise evident on her face. You're awake, she exclaimed, relief washing over her. She informed me that I had been out for two days and that the doctors were astounded I had survived the ordeal. But what about the woman? I asked, my heart pounding in my chest. I didn't even know her name, and yet I felt a strange connection to her, bound by our shared trauma. The nurse's face softened. She's alive, she said, in a room down the hall, still unconscious but stable. 
You saved her life. Relief washed over me. We had made it. We were safe. But there was no time to relax. I needed answers. Who was she? What was that entity? And most importantly, why us? I spent the rest of the day grilling the hospital staff for information, but they knew little. They found us on the outskirts of the forest, both unconscious, near the bottom of the staircase. They had no clue about the entity or the strange occurrences surrounding the staircase. I couldn't help but feel frustrated. All that we had gone through and still there were more questions than answers. As I lay in bed that night staring at the ceiling, my thoughts wandered back to the woman. I wondered what she was like, what her life was before all this. I wondered if she remembered anything about the entity, about the staircase. With these thoughts swirling in my mind, I drifted off to sleep. My dreams were filled with shadows and dark figures, the entity lurking in the corners. I woke up in a cold sweat, heart pounding. The nightmare felt so real, so vivid. As the days passed, I slowly started to recover. My ribs healed and the pain subsided, but the nightmares persisted, a constant reminder of the trauma we had endured. One day, as I was sitting in my room, reading a book to distract myself from my thoughts, the door creaked open. I looked up to see the woman standing there, her eyes meeting mine. She looked frail, but there was a determined set to her jaw, a fire in her eyes. She looked like a survivor, just like me. A wave of relief washed over me. She was awake. We were both survivors. We had a chance to figure out the truth behind our ordeal. Together, we could face the aftermath of our encounter with the entity. The days turned into weeks, and the woman, I learned her name was Kate, and I slowly recovered, physically at least. The psychological scars ran deeper. Every night I was haunted by nightmares, replaying our desperate flight from the entity. Kate confided that she experienced the same. We became each other's support system, a beacon of strength in the enveloping darkness. One day Kate suggested we revisit the forest, to face our fears. I agreed, believing it could bring closure, help us move on. I knew not the folly of this decision. We arrived at the forest edge early in the morning, the sunlight casting long shadows that seemed to dance and flicker with a sinister life of their own. I could feel the cold tendrils of fear curling in my stomach, but I gritted my teeth and pressed on, Kate beside me. The forest was silent as we made our way through. It was as if every creature, every whisper of the wind, held its breath, waiting. The staircase loomed ahead, as eerie and out of place as ever. It stood there, a monument to our harrowing past, unblemished by the ravages of time. We ascended slowly, the steps creaking under our weight. At the top, we paused, surveying the surrounding landscape. It was peaceful, serene even, a stark contrast to the terror we had experienced. Just as I started to relax, thinking that perhaps we had truly escaped the nightmare, I felt a cold chill rush down my spine. The air seemed to thicken, the light dimmed, and the forest fell silent. A familiar dread filled me. We turned simultaneously towards the staircase. It was happening again. The stone steps, moments before bathed in sunlight, now glistened with a deep malevolent darkness. I could feel the presence of the entity, stronger than ever. Its power washed over us like an icy wave. No. Kate whispered beside me, her face pale, her eyes wide with fear. The darkness swelled, oozing from the staircase, wrapping around us. I could hear it whispering, a cacophony of discordant voices that filled my mind, my soul with terror. I reached for Kate, my fingers closing around her hand. I could feel her trembling, matching my own fear. We backed away slowly, but the darkness followed, persistent, hungry. The entity had returned, and this time it felt stronger, more menacing. I tried to scream, to shout, but my voice was drowned in the consuming darkness. All I could see were Kate's eyes, mirroring my own terror. The entity closed in, its whispers growing louder, its power overwhelming. As the darkness consumed us, I realized that this was it. We were not survivors. We were prisoners, bound to this entity, to this staircase. We had tried to confront our past, to seek closure, but instead, we had walked straight back into the jaws of our nightmare. In our quest for understanding, we had become the hunted again, doomed to relive the horror eternally. And as the darkness enveloped us completely, I knew that the true terror had just begun.
Every morning, as the sun stretched its rays over the tops of the mountains, I'd pause and watch as the day painted itself into existence. I was a park ranger, had been for a decade, and the Greywood National Park was my sanctuary. The melody of the birds floating through the crisp morning air was a familiar symphony that always welcomed me into the wilderness. This place was an unending canvas of serenity. I knew every dip and rise in the land, every old tree that had withstood the test of time, and every river that ran wildly, carrying with it stories untold. I had the privilege of immersing myself in this wonder every single day, but being a ranger meant more than just coexisting with nature. It meant understanding it, preserving it, and at times unraveling the mysteries it held within its depths. Over the years I had encountered a myriad of strange occurrences. There were tales spun around flickering campfires, stories of hikers disappearing into thin air, and campers swearing they had seen lights moving in patterns across the night sky. Each account was stranger than the last, but such stories were a part of the job, an eerie allure that kept the forest feeling forever unknown, forever wild. But of all the tales, one held a particularly ominous reputation, the Whispering Woods. It was a dark and dense patch of forest, where the trees huddled together like they were sharing secrets, their twisted branches reaching out, covering the sky and shrouding the area in an eerie darkness, even during the brightest of days. The forest floor was a world unto itself, housing epiphytes that found their homes in the tree trunks, never once touching the ground. The dense foliage was broken occasionally by vines that stretched between the trees like natural bridges. The Whispering Woods got its name from the stories of strange whispers that filled the night. Some claimed it was the ghosts of past wanderers, while others argued it was the voices of felled trees, their spirits restless after a storm that had ravaged the area years ago. But to me, it mattered little what the whispers were. I just knew that I wanted nothing to do with them. During my ten years at Greywood, I had explored every inch of the park, yet I had never set foot in the Whispering Woods. I had not the courage nor the curiosity to find out if the rumors were true. When your job involves the strange and the unexplainable, you learn when to respect the unknown. The woods were a mystery best left untouched. Yet, as I carried out my duties, patrolling the familiar trails and observing the grandeur of nature unfold, I couldn't shake off a feeling of dread. It was as if the whispering woods watched me from a distance, an unseen entity waiting silently for the right moment. It was unsettling, but I pushed the feeling aside. Little did I know, the forest was about to reveal a secret that would forever change the way I looked at it. And it all began with a group of terrified hikers. On a day much like any other, the tranquil hum of the forest was shattered by an echo of panic. A group of hikers stumbled into the ranger station, their faces ghostly white, their eyes wide with a fear I had rarely seen before. I heard it, I swear, one of them stammered, pointing in the direction of the whispering woods. Voices, they were whispering my name. Hesitant murmurs and frightened glances were exchanged among the group. I tried to reassure them suggesting the wind or the rustling leaves could have played tricks on their senses, but they remained inconsolable. Their stories bore an eerie similarity to the old tales. As much as I wanted to dismiss their claims, a shiver of unease crept down my spine. I escorted the terrified hikers to the edge of the park, advising them to seek shelter in town for the night. As they walked away, I couldn't shake off the unsettling feeling. I stood there, watching the sun dip below the horizon, its golden light slowly giving way to an engulfing darkness. For the first time in years, I decided to stay back in the park overnight. A part of me hoped to put the rumors to rest, the other part yearned to understand what truly lurked within the whispering woods. I set up a small camp near the edge of the woods, far enough to avoid unwanted attention, yet close enough to hear any unusual sounds. The night was quiet, save for the gentle chorus of the nocturnal creatures. I was beginning to believe that the hikers had imagined their experience when I heard it. A low whisper, barely audible over the chirping crickets. It seemed to echo from the heart of the forest. My heart pounded in my chest, adrenaline racing through my veins. I approached the edge of the whispering woods, flashlight in hand, straining my ears to pick up the sounds again. I was met with an eerie silence. Moments passed, each second stretching into what felt like an eternity. 
I was about to abandon my post when I heard my name, whispered softly, as if carried by the wind. My blood ran cold. It wasn't a hallucination. The woods were indeed whispering. I staggered back, overwhelmed. The stories I had dismissed as mere campfire tales were turning into a chilling reality. What was supposed to be just another day at work had spiraled into a night fraught with fear and confusion. I retreated to my tent, my mind whirring with questions and apprehension. Throughout the night, the whispers continued. Sometimes they were so low that I thought I was imagining them. At other times, they were so loud that I was forced to cover my ears. I didn't sleep a wink that night the horrifying truth echoing in my ears. By the time the sun peeked over the horizon, I knew what I had to do. I was not just a ranger anymore. I was an unwitting participant in a supernatural mystery that stretched back decades. I was drawn into a mission, whether I liked it or not, to solve the secret of the whispering woods. After all, the forest was my responsibility, my sanctuary, and I could not just turn a blind eye to the danger that lurked within. With the break of dawn, I found myself filled with an uncanny resolve. I was determined to uncover the truth about the whispering woods, regardless of how deep and dark the rabbit hole would go. Armed with my ranger gear and a newfound sense of purpose, I set out towards the town library, the repository of our small town's collective memories. Walking through the creaky doors of the old building, I was met with the familiar smell of age and wisdom, of secrets nestled in the yellowed pages of countless books. The librarian, Mrs. Anderson, looked up from her desk, peering at me over her spectacles. I wasn't expecting to see you here, she said with a smile, noting the serious expression on my face. Need help finding something? I do, Mrs. Anderson, I replied, motioning towards the section of local history. I briefly explained my mission, though I left out the part about hearing my name whispered in the woods. Even in our town, where folk tales were part of daily life, I feared my experience would be dismissed as a wild imagination. Her eyes widened as I finished my story, a mixture of excitement and worry gleaming in her gaze. Well, if it's the old tales you're after, you'd better buckle up. There's more to those stories than you'd think. Guided by her expertise, we spent the morning rummaging through dusty records, worn out maps, and old newspaper clippings. The tales varied, but a single thread ran through them all, voices in the whispering woods, mysterious disappearances, and an unexplainable sense of dread that had loomed over the town for generations. As the hours passed, one story caught my attention. It was about a local girl who had vanished in the woods 50 years ago, never to be seen again. She had been a respected forest ranger, just like me, and her disappearance had sent ripples of panic through the town. The case was never solved, and over the years, it faded into yet another unsolved mystery of our town. I couldn't help but feel a connection with her. We shared the same job, the same love for the forest, and now, the same eerie experience. A chill ran down my spine as I thought of her fate. Could I meet the same end if I continued to investigate? But then, I thought of the hikers, their faces ashen, their voices trembling with fear. I thought of the whispering woods, their secrets shrouded in darkness. No, I couldn't let fear stop me. If there was a threat lurking in the woods, it was my duty to face it, not run away. Armed with the information gathered, I thanked Mrs. Anderson and headed back towards the park. As I left the library, the sun was setting, painting the sky with hues of orange and red. I could feel the weight of the town's history pressing down on me, a symphony of whispers in my ears. There was no denying it any longer. The whispering woods were more than just a forest. They were an enigma cloaked in decades of fear and unanswered questions. As I stepped into the cooling evening, one thing was certain. I had a long night ahead, a night that was sure to bring me closer to the truth or throw me deeper into the shadows of the past. Night had descended, blanketing the town in a comforting darkness. But as I stared into the depths of the whispering woods, comfort was the last thing on my mind. Each rustling leaf and distant animal call only heightened my senses, my heart pounding like a drum in my chest. I knew this was it. Tonight I would either uncover the truth about the voices, or I would become yet another unsolved mystery of our town. Equipped with my ranger flashlight and a walkie-talkie, I ventured into the woods, my boots crunching on the foliage below. 
Each step further into the labyrinth of trees felt like stepping into another world, a world that was eerie and alive with whispers. I could hear them clearly now, the whispering voices, their ethereal tones reverberating off the trunks of the ancient trees. It felt like they were guiding me, leading me deeper into the forest. I fought the urge to call out, focusing instead on following the strange trail that seemed to open before me. After what felt like hours, I reached a clearing. Bathed in moonlight, it felt oddly serene amid the cacophony of whispers, and in its center stood an ancient tree, its branches stretched wide as if embracing the sky. Its bark was scarred, marking the passage of countless years, its gnarled roots burrowing deep into the earth. But what caught my attention was the shadowy figure standing before it. Tall and indistinct, it was a shape more than a person, as if the night itself had taken form. My heart pounded in my chest, my hand instinctively reaching for the walkie-talkie. But something stopped me, a sense of familiarity, a strange comfort that washed over me, drowning the fear that had been brewing in my heart. I've been expecting you, the figure spoke, its voice echoing with the whispers of the forest. I could barely make out its features, but its eyes shone like two bright stars in the darkness. You are the one brave enough to seek the truth, to seek me. Who are you? I asked, my voice trembling with a mixture of fear and excitement. What's happening in these woods? I am a guardian, it replied, stepping into the moonlight, revealing a face not of a monster, but a woman. Her skin seemed to glow, her hair floating like a cloud around her head. She was beautiful and terrifying all at once. She was the girl who had disappeared, the ranger who was lost but never forgotten. Long ago I was chosen by the forest to protect it, but I failed and was consumed by it. Now it's your turn, she said, her voice soft yet authoritative. You must uncover the truth about the whispering woods, reveal its secrets, and save those who dare to enter. Her words were like a punch to my gut. I was a forest ranger, yes, but a guardian of an ancient woodland entity. The reality of it all was overwhelming, yet as I looked into her eyes, I knew I couldn't back down. And so, under the light of the moon, by the ancient tree in the whispering woods, I accepted my destiny. The whispers quietened, the forest sighed, and the woman disappeared, leaving me alone with my resolve. The woods were no longer a mystery, they were a responsibility, a mantle I had to bear. And I knew, come morning, I had a lot of work to do. Having embraced my newfound role as the guardian, I returned to the town, greeted by the morning sun. The townsfolk looked at me with curious eyes, their whispers hushed as I passed by. I didn't mind. My purpose had transcended their idle gossip. But as I walked the familiar paths, I felt a chilling wind follow me, the whispers of the woods trailing behind. It seemed that accepting the mantle didn't silence the voices. Instead, they were growing louder, more desperate. In the heart of the town, the whispers coalesced into an echoing plea. I turned to see our town's ancient statue, a tribute to our founding ancestors. But something was amiss. The stone faces of the founders, usually stern and silent, seemed to grimace, as if in agony. My instincts kicked in. I rushed to the statue, scanning its rugged surface. The whispers crescendoed into a haunting melody, the voices entwining around the stone figures. My hand instinctively reached out, pressing against the cold stone. Suddenly, a surge of energy passed through me, a jumble of thoughts, memories, and voices. Images flashed before my eyes, our founders, the Whispering Woods' origin, the girl, me. It was a kaleidoscope of history, tangled in the roots of the town and the woods. Then came the truth, darker and more horrifying than any tale our town had spun, the Founders hadn't stumbled upon these lands. They had sacrificed the forest's original guardian, damning her spirit to the woods, to gain control of the town's destiny. And each subsequent guardian, including the girl and the ranger, had met the same fate, consumed by the relentless whispers. I staggered back, my breath ragged. The town we lived in, the woods we feared, were built on lies and betrayal. The whispers weren't just voices, they were screams of the forest's stolen guardians their pain and desperation echoing through centuries. But the most terrifying realization was yet to come. The whispers grew louder, no longer just in my ears but in my head, their pleas turning into commands. I felt the woods calling out, pulling at my very soul, a magnetic force that was both terrifying and irresistible. 
The whispers promised peace, an end to the suffering. But at what cost? I ran. I ran not out of fear, but determination. I had to break the cycle, free the forest, and the spirits trapped within. I had to confront the town with its sinister past and ensure that no future guardian would suffer the same fate. My resolve, however, did not silence the whispers. Instead, they became a terrifying symphony, their voices merging into a single chilling refrain. Join us. And as the shadows of the whispering woods stretched out towards me, the chilling wind howling with their sorrowful melody, I knew my fight was only just beginning. The road ahead was long and fraught with danger, and the terrifying whisper of the woods would be my constant companion. But I was ready, ready to face whatever lurked in the shadows. For I was no longer just a forest ranger. I was the guardian, the only hope for my town and the tormented souls of the whispering woods.